David, welcome back to Houston. We're delighted to have you. And uh, we know Houston has a, a special place in your heart for, for reasons you detail a little bit in the book. But uh, yeah, well, welcome back. I spent uh, three years courting a woman who lived here, um, <laughs> starting in 2013 to 2016. And so I would come down here on an almost bi-weekly basis. Uh, I learned that every time you turn left while driving in Houston, you're on Westheimer. <laughs> No matter where it is, so it's the restaurant, it's on Westheimer. <laughs> I also, back in the day, I was running a lot more than I am now. And running uh, in July in Herman Park was always a joy. <laughs> if you remember that that place has a little kitty train, I used to lay on the tracks hoping it would run me over to get, <laughs> get out of the heat. But she actually came down here to work for the HEB Foundation. Uh, everybody loved it. I, I mm -hmm. say HEB, everybody goes, ah. Oh. <laughs> Um, and um, she was living in D.C. before as a journalist and came down to write about immigration. I was like, there, there's not much diversity in Houston. Uh, <laughs> so I really knew what I was talking about. Uh, and so I courted her for all those years, and I was teaching at Yale, and she, came, she flew up to New Haven to tell me whether or not she would marry me. Mm. And so we met at a, a, a hike I used to take, and she told me she could never marry me. Uh, and now she's upstairs answering emails. So <laughs> we got married, and it's all good. <laughs> and, and Dave, I just want to say thank you. You've been always one of the most popular and, and, and most inspirational speakers we've had uh, over the years. Um, any of you who are regular members, we're often covering what's going wrong in the world, what's happening with Russia and Ukraine, what's happening with China, maybe Taiwan, you know, various crises in the Middle East. Um, it's nice to, the book, you detail what, what, the, what some of the problems are, where things are going wrong, but it's very nice to have someone who's a positive outlook and a positive approach. I'm not just telling you what's wrong, here are some ideas of, of how we can fix it. Um, maybe before we get into the core of the book itself, um, it's entertaining at the beginning of the book, people will enjoy it. Can you talk about your own transition and, and you, you note how this is not a static process. You, you can be in your 50s, 60s, 70s, you can keep evolving as a human. Maybe your yeah. own transition from when you mentioned, I was brought up to you know, think Yiddish and act British and, and you've come a long way since. Yeah, yeah so <laughs> if anybody saw the movie Fiddler on the Roof, you know how warm and huggy Jewish families can be, always singing and laughing and dancing. <laughs> And so I come from the other kind of Jewish family. <laughs> and so our culture was think Yiddish, act British, very stiff upper lip. And then when I was four, my nursery school teacher told my parents, David doesn't really play with the other kids. He just observes them, <laughs> which was good for a career in journalism, uh, but maybe not for developing emotionally strong relationships. And then when I was seven, I, um, uh, I, did, I read a book called Paddings and the Bear and decided I want to become a writer. And being a writer, I've been writing pretty much every day since then, uh, is again, a pretty solitary profession. I write every day from seven to about one in the afternoon. And when I used to wear a Fitbit, it would tell me I was napping uh, because my heartbeat would go down. And that was sort of the core of my, my identity was to be a writer. In high school, I wanted to date a woman named Bernice and she didn't want to date me, she wanted to date some other guy. And I remember thinking, what is she thinking? I write way better than that guy. <laughs> so those are my values. But again, sort of solitary. And then when I was 18, the admissions officers at Columbia Wesleyan and Brown decided I should go to the University of Chicago. Uh, and if you know Chicago, it's the famous saying, where fun goes to die. Uh, my favorite saying about the school is, it's a Baptist school where atheist professors teach Jewish students St. Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> and so, I, it was a very cerebral, intellectual place, and I fit right in. Uh, I had a double major at Chicago in history and celibacy while I was there. <laughs> um, and so that symbolized sort of an emotionally removed way of being in the world. Uh, and the, the moment I talk about in the book that symbolized for me a bad way of living is I'm a big baseball fan, and I've been to hundreds of games, and I've never caught a foul ball. <laughs> But I'm at Camden Yards with my youngest son, and a batter loses control of the bat. It flies in the air, lands in my lap, and I have a bat. <laughs> and so getting a bat is a thousand times better than getting a ball. <laughs> so any normal human being is like waving his trophy in the air, high-fiving, hugging, getting on the jumbotron. I just put the bat on the ground and stared straight ahead like an <laughs> emotional reaction of a turtle. Uh, 
and so that was like a sign to me, eh, maybe it's not the best way to live. And so I sort of tried to work on myself the only way I knew how, which is writing. <laughs> and so like true University of Chicago fashion, I wrote a book about emotion to learn about emotion <laughs> called The Social Animal. And then to do moral improvement, I wrote a book about uh, character formation called The Road to Character. And I learned writing that book um, that writing a book on character doesn't give you good character. And <laughs> even reading a book on character doesn't give you good character. But buying a book on character does give you good character. <laughs> And so anyway, anyway, there was like a, a 10 year evolution. And uh, I was at a conference in Nantucket about a year and a half ago. And it's a room like this one. And the organizer of the session gives everybody a, a song sheet, a piece of paper with lyrics to a love song. And then he says to each of us, now go find some you don't, someone you don't know, stare into their eyes, and sing the love song to them. <laughs> And if you had told me to do that 10 years ago, I would have spontaneously combusted. <laughs> but I did it. I, I think I've changed and grown and gotten a little more in tune with my emotions and in tune with, with, with other people, really. Like, no one used to confide in me. And now people come to me with a personal problem, and I, I, I don't panic as much as I used to. So it's, it's a process of growth. Well, uh, writers are working out our stuff in public. That's what writing is. And, and we'll get to the kind of the growth, the steps that are attainable for all of us to work on, and, and these, aren't, these aren't just things you've conjured up or over time you've met with dozens of experts, done a lot of research yourself, um, but maybe just to kind of preface it for why it's perhaps always needed, but why it's needed now more than ever. Maybe you could explain why it is you deter to describe the way our culture and society is now, that it's, it's gotten to a point of being kind of dehumanizing. And, and yeah. the, the degree of social disconnectedness is so dire. And, and why it's so concerning at, a, at maybe an individual and a familial level, and then at a bigger, broader level, at a national level. Yeah, so as this process, this little personal growth process of trying to become more human is happening over the last 10 years, American society as a whole has become more dehuman. And so we're all familiar with the statistics, the rise of mental health problems, the rise of suicide. Suicide's up 30%, but up 50 or 70% among teenagers. Then there are a bunch of statistics that are just weird. So the number of Americans who say they have no close personal friends is up fourfold since 2000. Uh, the number of high schoolers who rate themselves, who say they are persistently hopeless and despondent is now 45%. The number of Americans who rate themselves in the lowest happiness category is up by 50% since 2000. Uh, the number of Americans who say that no one knows them well is now 54%. The number of Americans who are not in any romantic relationship is up by a third. So it's just one thing after another of loneliness and sadness. And when you have a sad country, you also get a mean country. Because when people feel invisible, unseen, they regard it as an injustice, which it is, and their evolutionary roots say, I'm under threat if no one sees me. We evolved to be with bands of people who are looking out for each other. And so I cited all those sadness statistics. I could cite you meanness statistics, gun violence, hate crimes. The one that really gets me is uh, only 23 years ago, uh, two thirds of Americans gave to charity. Now fewer than 50% of Americans give to charity. Hmm. So just less connection. And then the biggest statistic, and probably the most important for our social health, is if you asked Americans a generation ago, do you trust the people around you? It used to be 60%, and now it's 30%, and 19% of millennials and Gen Z. The younger you go, the more distrustful people are. And without social trust, it's really hard to do business. It's hard to organize your community. It's hard to persuade people to take vaccines. And so the, the cancer of distrust is just pervasive in our society. And so the obvious questions are, well, why? What's happening? And there are a bunch of stories, all of which I think has a piece of the truth, which is one, social media is driving us all crazy, technology story, sociology story, this is Robert Putnam. We're less active in civic life than we used to be, so we're not dealing with the PTA or whoever we used to deal with. Uh, third, economics which is um, we're more unequal, and so we're living more dissimilar lives. Fourth, demography. It's easier to be a, a more cohesive society when everybody looks and thinks the same. 
but we've become wonderfully diverse. But it makes it a little harder, because you've got to navigate differences. Uh, and so those are all true stories. Uh, the story I tell is the most direct, which is a moral formation story, that we just don't treat each other with kindness and consideration. And that being open-hearted and being trustworthy involves being warm, but it also involves basic social skills. How to listen well, how to ask for an offer of forgiveness, how to host a dinner party so everybody feels included. Uh, and these are just skills. They're skills like carpentry or learn to play tennis. And for some reason, they haven't been taught. And I've been teaching college for a long time. And I had one of my students, for example, in my recent class. Um, she's had four boyfriends in her life. At the end of each relationship, not a single one had the breakup conversation. They just ghosted or they just vanished. Mm -hmm. So of course she's distrustful of the next guy who comes along. And nobody taught those guys, when you're breaking up with someone, have the conversation, explain why it's not working out, and try to end the relationship in, in a way that won't break their heart. But they didn't know how to do that, so they just vanished. And so I, I focus on just basic social skills, and the book is an attempt to just walk people through the social skills of how to be considerate toward each other in the complete, concrete circumstances of life. And at a national level, there's a lot of very interesting and kind of enlightening information here. But one of the things probably, to me, I, at first I thought about Mr. Heady this was, um, we're just talking about distrust, sowing distrust. And a lot of people might think people join politics, get in politics because they're, they're naturally good with people, they're, they're amiable, people like a big group. But you said people who have loneliness are seven times more likely to be involved in politics. In some ways, it's because they're looking for a sense of identification. They're looking for something to belong to. And then the scary flip side of that is then it, you know, our modern politics devolves into resentment and this idea of building a, a camp of us versus them. You talk about how this loneliness and kind of lack of communication is affecting our politics. Yeah, well, that research that people who are lonely are seven times more likely to volunteer comes from a guy named Ryan Streeter who's at UT. Uh, and uh, I think what happens is you leave people naked and alone and in a moral landscape that has no features. You leave them morally inarticulate. Politics is a seductive form of social therapy for them because they think they have community, which is our team versus their team. But you don't really have community. You're not sitting together in a meeting. You're not sharing meals. You're just hating the same people. You think you have moral purpose that you grow, you're watching your TV show and you're getting indignant at the other side. But that's not the morality of serving the poor or sitting with a widow. It's just growing indignant. And so it doesn't really give you community. It doesn't really give you a sense of moral purpose. It just creates uh, the illusion you're gonna have these things. So you're trying to escape loneliness, but you just enter the world of moral war. And I think in healthy societies, we have what you might call the politics of distribution. How should we distribute the resources of our society? How high should taxes should be? Where should spending? That's a normal society. And of unhealthy society, you have the politics of recognition. What people want out of politics is just have, I want to be validated, and I want them to be humiliated. And I think we have a lot of the politics of recognition going on in this society. And it's a symptom of a society that's just basically not healthy on the relational level. And, you know, like saying, we will move into the positive, <laughs> unlike a lot of the events we do here. Um, maybe you could discuss, uh, it's a beautiful term, what you call kind of illuminators, and what, what they mean and what they represent. And maybe, maybe all of us might be harder to do that, but also your concept of accompaniment. And that's something maybe is a little more attainable and graspable by just everybody. Maybe you could talk yeah. about these kind of first positive steps to think in terms yeah. of, of how you can reach out and connect with other people. Yeah, so I just walk people through the steps of how do you get to know somebody. And so I make this distinction between diminishers and illuminators. And so a diminisher are people who are just not curious about you. They don't ask you questions. And I'll often leave a party and I'll think, you know, that whole time nobody asked me a question. And I'll, I, I've come to conclude that only about 40% of humanity are question askers. The rest are nice people, but they just don't ask you questions. And so they're just not that curious about you. Uh, and so diminishers are not curious about you. They stereotype you. They ignore. They do a thing called stacking, 
which is if I learn one fact about you, you supported Donald Trump, then I can then make a whole series of assumptions about who you must be. And that's called <laughs> stacking. And it's almost always wrong. I, ran a, read, I re heard about a woman who's a big Trump supporter, who's a lesbian biker, who converted to Sufi Islam after surviving a plane crash. Like, what stereotype does she fit into? Like, mo most people are more complicated than their stereotypes. Um, now, on the other hand, illuminators, they're curious about you. They make you feel heard. They want to know your story. And they just make you feel lit up. And so there was a biographer named, um, or a novelist named E.M. Foster. And his biographer wrote of him, I'm going to paraphrase, to listen to him was to be seduced by an inverse charisma. A sense of being listened to with such intensity, you had to be your sharpest, most honest self. Imagine how good it would be to be able to listen that intensely to people. There's a woman named Jenny Jerome, who was in Victorian England, and would later become the mother of Winston Churchill. But when she's a young woman, she's at a dinner party, and she's seated next to the Prime Minister, William Gladstone. And she leaves that dinner thinking that Gladstone is the cleverest person in England. Then sometime later, she's at another dinner, and she happens to be seated next to Gladstone's great political rival, Benjamin Disraeli. And she leaves that dinner thinking that she's the cleverest person in England. <laughs> <laughs> so it's good to be Gladstone. It's better to be Disraeli, to make people feel like, yeah, yeah, that's so good. And so I'll just walk through the first two phases of getting to know someone. The first is when you first meet somebody. When we first meet somebody, everyone's asking themselves a question unconsciously. Is this person going to be nice to me? Am I a priority to this person? Can I trust this person? And the answers to those questions are expressed in the eyes before any words come into your mouth. So it's the power of the first gaze. So I'm uh, about four years ago, I'm in Waco. And I'm having, which must be close to here. It's Texas. How big could it be? Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I'm having breakfast with a 93-year-old lady named LaRue Dorsey, who had been a teacher. And she presents herself to me as a stern disciplinarian. Like she said, I love my students enough to discipline them. She was a formidable lady, and I was a little intimidated by her. So we're at the diner, and into the diner walks a mutual friend of ours, a guy named Jimmy Durrell. And Jimmy pastors a church called Church Under the Bridge, which serves the homeless who, who live under the highway overpass. And he walks up to our table, and he grabs Mrs. Dorsey by the shoulders and shakes her way harder than you should ever shake a 93-year-old. <laughs> and he looks in her eyes, and he says, Mrs. Dorsey, Mrs. Dorsey, you're the best. You're the best. I love you. I love you. And that stern disciplinarian turned in an instant into a bright, eye-shining nine-year-old girl. He brought forth a different version of her with his gaze. And part of it is Jimmy has a warmer personality than I do. But part of it, he's a pastor. And so when he's seeing someone, anybody, he thinks he's seeing someone made in the image of God. He's looking into the face of God. He's looking at somebody so important that Jesus is willing to die for that person. And you can be Christian, Jewish, atheist, Muslim, I don't care, but have, approaching each person with that level of reverence and respect is a precondition for seeing them well. That's the first step. And then the second step is what you mentioned, accompaniment. Now, most of the time when we're with other people, we're not having deep heart-to-heart -heart conversations. We're just hanging out. We're at a meeting. We're picking up our kids from school. We're at, at the grocery store. And accompaniment is an other-centered way of being in normal life. So think of the way a pianist accompanies a singer. He, he's observing the singer. He's trying to make her shine. So it's just an other-centered way of being. And some of the great ways of hanging out to really get to know someone before you really know them is playing at something. Whether it's poker, whether it's badminton, God help us, pickleball. <laughs> um, but when you're playing, you're sort of like naturally yourself. And I have guys I've played basketball with, and we've never had deep conversations. But over the years, there's a way of passing, there's trash talk, there's high fives. We sort of know each other. And I remember once, um, my oldest son, he was born in Brussels, and he, he woke up, God bless him, at 4 every morning. And I woke up with him and played with him until I went to work at about 10. And so we had six solid hours. And I remember one time when he was about 12 or 13 months thinking, I know him better than I've ever known anybody. And he knows me better than anybody's known me because we've just been playing. 
And we had never exchanged a word because he couldn't talk yet. <laughs> but it was just through play. And that's a good way to sort of get used to somebody. And then the other piece of accompaniment I mentioned is just the art of presence. Just being present for people when they need you. And the story I tell was told to me by a, one of my students named Jillian Sawyer. And I had her as a grad student. And when she was um, an undergrad, her dad got pancreatic cancer. And they had conversations about the fact that she, he would miss a lot of her big life events. And so he died, and then the summer after college, she was invited to be a bridesmaid for a friend. And she's there as a bridesmaid, and she's missing her dad. And she watches the, at the wedding the, the bride's father give a beautiful toast to his daughter. And then it comes time for the father-daughter dance. And she thinks, eh, I'm just going to miss this one. So she goes to the ladies' room to have a cry. And when she gets out of the ladies' room, every single people from her table at the reception and the adjoining table are in the hall. And she wrote to me in a paper, which she gave me permission to quote in the book. I can't remember exactly what the words were. But when I got out, there was just a line of people. And nobody said anything. They didn't try to validate my grief. They each just gave me a hug and then went back to the table. And it was exactly what I needed. And so somebody at that table or the adjoining table understood the situation when she left the ladies' room and said, let's go be there for Jillian. And that's not like heart to heart, but it's just like being present for somebody when they need it. And it's just a beautiful way of accompanying someone who's going through something hard. Um, you know, I think another, there are a lot of great quotes from yourself and from the you know, array of, of incredible experts you, you, you cover in the book. Um, but in terms of how to really get to know someone, you mentioned how we can, 10 of us can be the exact same event, the exact same experience, the exact same set of facts, but we've all come away from it with a different you know, perspective. Um, and in some ways, maybe you could talk about this idea, you, 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 one of the quotes is, you know, the idea that we shouldn't think of um, you know, what they, they see, but who they are in terms of how they experience that event that you may have gone through or that you know, period in their life, in terms of yeah. what, what sort of person they are is going to determine as much how they react to this event as anything else, and maybe in terms of you know, how we get to know somebody deeper in terms of knowing yeah. who they are. Yeah, one of, I, I didn't put most of this in the book, but one of the things I did a lot of research on neuroscience. And so the book is called How to See a Person. I, uh, how to know a person but seeing others. So I think I should understand what seeing is. So our common sense view of what seeing is, it tells us that you open your eyes, light comes in, and you sort of record what's out there in this room the way an old-fashioned film camera records light. That's not how seeing works. If you tried to do that, you would just be overwhelmed with data. So seeing is not passive reception. Seeing is projecting out a series of models on what I expect to see based on what the world was like last time I was in a circumstance like this. And so it's an act of creative construction. And so just quickly examples, there's no such thing as color in the universe. There's no such thing as sound in the universe. It's all just particles and light waves. But we create color and sound and story because that's, that's all happening up here, it's not out there. It shows how creative it is. And it depends on what models we have in our head. And so for example, most of us in this room who are English speakers, when you see after a rainstorm, you look up and you see a rainbow. And for most of us, we see seven banded rainbows. Now in reality, a rainbow has no bands. It's a continuum of light. But we construct because we have color for yellow, uh, blue, or whatever it is. Now Russians have two different words for blue, light blue and dark blue. And so they see an eight banded rainbow. And so the point I'm making is that what we see in the world is a subjective construction of reality, not what's really out there. And so there's a famous experiment done in the 60s where they had people at Princeton and people at, I think it was Penn or maybe Cornell, watch, they watched a violent football game between the two and each side thought the other team had committed twice as many penalties as their team. So they showed them the game film a couple weeks later after they'd calmed down 
and each side pointed to the game film and said, see, it proves the other side committed twice as much penalties as our side. <laughs> it was the same game film, they just saw it differently. And so the lesson from Aldous Huxley is experience is not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you. And so when you read all this neuroscience, you're amazed we can see anything the same. And you're not surprised when Donald Trump people see one reality and Joe Biden people see a different reality because we're all constructing subjective reality. So if I want to see what's going on in your head, I can't try to imagine. It's too different. You're creating a, your own subjective reality. So I have to ask you a question. And so when there's a guy at UT Arlington who studies how well we understand each other when we first meet, and how well do you guys understand other people? Well, I don't know most of you, but I can tell you with great confidence you're not as good as you think you are. <laughs> and this guy at UT Arlington, a guy named Icus, William Icus, um, concludes that we understand each other accurately about 20% of the time. Some people are really good 55% of the time, and some people are 0% of the time but think they're 100% of the time. <laughs> and those are the people who are missing all the social cues you're sending off, like maybe it's time you stop talking. Um, and so you ha the, the key is, to, if you want to know somebody else, you have to ask them a question. You have to be really good at conversation. And so perspective taking is not good. Perspective asking is good. And so it's the conversational skills that are really at the heart of knowing other people. Um, and another, another part I really enjoyed is empathy and a you know, empathic person. Yes, there are probably some people who are inherently more empathic than others, or it just comes more naturally to them than others, but it, you, you say it's, it, it should be seen not just as an uh, innate set of skills, but something that can be worked upon. It's that they're kind of skills that you can formulate, you can improve upon. Could you maybe touch, touch about the three skills in particular you think yeah. make up what is at the core of empathy, or at least how to be more successful in it, and, and maybe give us an idea of, of how we could maybe work on it ourselves. Yeah, so all these skills that I'm talking about are like athletic skills. We're all born with different levels, naturally but nobody's good without practice, and we can all get a lot better. Uh, and so empathy, we think of it as like one thing, like you open up your heart and you feel what the other person's feeling, but really it's three things. It's one is, uh, is uh, no, I'm forgetting the words, but first is contagion, mirroring. Mirroring, yeah. I just, I, I see an emotion, and I discern it, and I begin to feel it in myself. And really what it's doing, your body, an, emo, an emotion is a body state and your body is expressing a certain emotion, your adrenaline is going, your guts are churning, and I see that and I reenact it in my own self. And that's, that's called, I, I'm catching an emotion from you. And people who have Botox injections, for example, have trouble understanding worry because they can't wrinkle their brow. <laughs> that's literally true, you will reenact it in your own body. On the other hand, if you take a pen and bite it so your mouth is smiling, you're happier. So always do that if you're feeling sad, Buy, bite a pen. Um, so that's mirroring. Then there's mentalizing, where you say, oh, I sort of understand what this person's going through because I went through it myself. And so it's the first day of the job. I remember the first day on the job. You got all these mixed emotions. You're excited, you got imposter syndrome, you're trying to remember all these names. So that's mentalizing, developing a theory of what's going on in your mind. And the third skill is caring. So con men are really good at understanding what's going on in people's mind, but we don't say they're empathetic because they don't care. And so it's the, like when, if, you're, if you come home crying from work and your little infant hands you a Band-Aid, it's sweet, but it's not effective care. And so caring is doing what the other person wants, not what you want. And so for example, there's a, a rabbi, El, Elliot Kukla, who I read about, who had a congregant who had suffered a brain injury and she sometimes just fell to the floor. And uh, she said to him, when I fall to the floor, people always rush to pick me up because they're un so uncomfortable seeing an adult lying on the floor. And she says, what I really need at that moment is for somebody to get down on the floor with me. And that's empathy. It's knowing what the other person wants and doing it even if it makes you feel uncomfortable. And sometimes you just have to get down on the floor with people, whether it's metaphorical or sometimes literal, I suppose. And so to me, that's what empathy is. I think one of the most powerful parts of this book um and it's something many of, a, many of us may have had to deal with in our own lives or, or people we care about within our family or friends. Uh, but it's something that there's no, aren't many guidelines out there for, but it's very hard and difficult to know 
what you can or cannot do or should or should not say for someone who's suffering. Um, in particular, um, I know this is you know, probably a, for you most difficult part of the book, um, in terms of a, a good friend or family member is dealing with severe depression. What is it that you've learned and taken away from it? And what would you, I suppose, extend to this audience to know in terms of, you know, it's okay to think this or say this, but, but here are maybe some, some steps to consider. Yeah, so my oldest friend in the world was a guy named Peter Marks, who we met when we were 12 at a summer camp. Uh, and our whole relation, our friendship was built on play. We played tennis, we played basketball, we played, even we could turn eating into a form of play, like we would smack our lips and have fun. Uh, and he had this charmed life, wonderful life. Uh, he uh, went to the Navy and became an eye surgeon, wonderful marriage, two great boys. And then in 2019, depression just hit him. And it was like a light went out. And so I thought I was a reasonably well-educated person. I should know what depression is. And I learned that if you're lucky enough never to have been hit with depression, you can't understand it by extrapolating from your own moments of sadness. It's not like that. Uh, another friend who had depression explained to me this way, that depression is a malfunction in the instrument you use to perceive reality. You're seeing a reality that does not correlate with, with what's really out there. And so my friend Pete had these obsessive compulsive voices in his head. Uh, you're worthless, you're worthless, nobody would miss you if you're gone. And then COVID hit, and so he, he suffered for this for three years. And COVID hit, and so a lot of our conversations were over the phone over COVID. He lived up in Connecticut, I was in DC. Uh, and um, I made the classic mistakes that people make. So the first thing I, mistake I made was I tried to give him advice on how to make the depression lift. So I said, you used to do these service trips to Vietnam, you should do that, that was so good for you. And I learned that when you're giving somebody who's depressed ideas about how to make the depression lift, all you're doing is showing them you just don't get it. Because it's not ideas they're lacking. It's desire and a lot of other things. The second mistake I made was I tried to do what the psychologists call positive reframing, remind him all the good things of his life. You've got a great marriage, you have a great career, your kids are amazing. And when you do that, you're just making the person feel worse because you're reminding them they're not enjoying the things that are palpably enjoyable. So in retrospect, what I think I, I wish I had done, and gradually I learned to do more over time, which was first, acknowledge the situation. This sucks. Tell me what it's like. Tell me more what it's like. The second thing I wish I'd done more of is um, just heartfelt signs of I'm with you, I'm for you. A pastor told me one thing he says to people in the circumstances is, I want more for you. I just want more for you. And those words won't do any good. And frankly, I learned that no words will do any good, really. But you can just say, I want more for you. I'm on your side. I'm not going anywhere. The, the depressed person feels you're going to leave. And so just say, I'm on your side. I'm, I'm not going anywhere. I wish I'd done more light touches, a text like every day. I heard about a case where somebody, his brother, when he was depressed, sent him postcards from wherever he was. Just like no response necessary. Just thinking of you. And then I read in a, a book, I hope a lot of people in this room have read, A Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, uh, where he was in the death, Nazi death camps, a psychiatrist in the death camps. And when he would have people coming expressing suicidal thoughts. And he said something that sounds harsh to me, but I trust him which is life has not stopped expecting things of you. That there's still things on this earth you are called to do. And you know, there's a famous phrase from Nietzsche that Frankel loves this phrase, he was a why to live for can endure anyhow. Thank if you have a clear sense of your purpose, you can endure the setbacks. And so Frankel is saying no, you're, the fact that you're suffering now is a, gives you credibility with others who are suffering. And there's a great Thornton Wilder quote that you're, your ability, you're, the fact that you're enduring this makes your low voice tremble in the hearts of men in love service only the wounded soldiers can serve. And so those are things I could have said. Now, it, Pete ended up about two years ago now ended up losing its battle with depression. And I don't think there's, I feel regret that I didn't say things, I didn't handle it more adeptly and make him feel 
more company. But I don't feel that there's anything I could have said that would have changed the outcome. In the way there's nothing his wife could have done anything else different to change the outcome. His boys couldn't have done anything else. And so the monster is just gigantic and none of us really could have been bigger than that monster. But it's just, it was a hard lesson in there are just things to say, ways to be and ways not to be. And I, it was a, a gradual education how to do that. Uh, and, and it was haunting to me because about a month before Pete's thing hit him, I was out in Oklahoma giving a talk, and it was one of those talks with, like this where the questions come on index cards, and they're the normal political questions. And then in the middle, I, I open the, flip the index card, and it says, what do you do if you no longer want to be alive? And I'm in, the, in front of a group like this, and I, I didn't know what to say, so I just skipped it over with some shame later, because I just didn't know what to say. Now I may know a little more to say. Um, and then I mentioned it that night, I was out with some friends, and the young woman I was with, or their husband, uh, she said, yeah, my brother took his life three months ago. It's like, and then you talk to your friends, and it's like, it's, in ev it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and the one thing I could have said to that Oklahoma lady was, um, I admire your courage because you're still here. To be in that much pain and still be here is a sign of great courage and persistence. So anyway, those, those are some of the things I learned through that hard education. And, and just to, you know, I don't, I don't want to dwell on a difficult subject. Um, you mentioned your, your dear friend Pete. It might have been so severe that it was difficult to see any, any other path that could have happened. But for people to know, in general, there, many others can come back from it. They can be yeah. saved. Um, you mentioned it, it might seem untoward or, or, or uneasy or difficult, but it is okay even to someone who is severely depressed to, to perhaps bring up the subject of suicide. You mentioned because they probably likely thought of it before. And it's much better to at least broach the issue and, and take the time to listen and compare, you know, care for them and be there. Maybe just uh, for, for other cases, maybe what you would say with regards to how we could approach it with a friend or a family member. Yeah, and this is, um, yeah, th this is one thing. I mean, it should be said, most people don't die of this. Mm -hmm. That a lot of people suffer from depression, they, they, it lifts. And we kept telling them it'll lift, it'll lift. Because if you want to know more, I, there are some books that are, I recommend. There's a very short, very brilliant book by the novelist William Styron called Darkness Visible which really is a, a walk through what depression feels like. There's another book, um, oh, now I'm gonna come back to it. I just had it on my tip of my tongue uh, 30 seconds ago, but it's gone. Um, uh, anyway, sorry. Uh, and one of the things, and so the psychologists and psychiatrists are all in agreement. You should mention it. You should mention suicide, because you're not introducing any thought they haven't thought of. Mm -hmm. uh, and Styron said, and he thought about it, he, he hit, depression hit him for the first time at age 60. And the way he explained it, he was, he was a writer, so he drank. Um, and, <laughs> and then he stopped drinking and he got hit with depression. Um, so I'm not risking it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, uh, but one of his friends said when they talked about suicide, and again, I, I, I'm not a professional, so don't trust me. His friend said to him, no, that's off the table. That is not, you are not doing that. Uh, and he said that helped him, just no, that's not happening. And the one thing I learned from Pete's experience, Pete was a tr sort of a classic, he felt he needed to protect somebody, take care of everybody around him. He, his dad was alcoholic, so he took care of everybody in his family. He became a doctor to take care of people, that was his mode. And I believe that in his final days and weeks, he thought he was doing people a favor. And I can tell you, having lived with the wreckage now for a couple of years, that if you ever think I would be doing people a favor by leaving the earth, that idea is completely wrong. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know how you could talk somebody out of that idea, yeah. but you can remind them that's, that's a lie. That is, your brain is lying to you right now. Um, and I'm gonna turn to the audience questions, but just uh, maybe to kind of conclude some of what you open the book with and what you, you uh, finish it with is the idea of, of a wise person, of wisdom. Um, you mentioned you know, it's not about knowledge, it's about knowing people. And in particular, you say it's, it's really not even knowing about how to help them, but helping 
to be there, to listen to them, to understand where they're coming from. Maybe if you give people a kind of a, a broader sense of your, your de developing idea of what wisdom is and kind of what you think people, you'd like them to get from the book. Yeah, I mean, I'd like them to be, uh, us all to become wiser presences with each other. And I used to think wisdom was like being Solomon or Yoda. You issue great maxims and pronouncements that solve everybody's problems. But I've come to think the wise person just receives our story, sees us in a noble struggle, and provides an atmosphere in which we can be ourselves. And so I, I, for the researching the book, I would go around and I would say, tell me about a time you felt seen. And some of the things were just very, stories people would tell me were very normal. Like one woman in her 40s told, said, you know, when I was 13, I had my first taste of alcohol. And I drank so much, when my friends dropped me off at home, they put me on the porch, and I was so drunk I couldn't move. And my father, who was this tough guy, came out, and I thought he was going to scream at me all the things that was already going on in my head. I'm bad, I'm bad. And said he just lifted her up, carried her inside, put her on the sofa, and said, there'll be no punishment here. You've had an experience. And 30 years later, she remembered that story. It was he knew she didn't, he didn't need to scream at her. Another very ordinary one was I asked a friend of mine. He said, well, let me tell you about my daughter. My daughter was in second grade, and she was struggling. And the teacher says to her one day, um, you know, you're really good at thinking before you speak. Uh, and that turned her whole year around, because what she thought was her social awkwardness, she said, oh, that's a strength. And I will say, when I ask people to tell me about the time they felt seen, the number one category of people they mention are their teachers. And I, when, when I read that statistics, I, I remembered my own 11th grade teacher, Mrs. Doosnap. I was in class being a smart aleck. And she said in front of the whole class, David, you're trying to get by on glibness, stop it. On the one hand, I was humiliated in front of the whole class. On the other hand, I thought, wow, she really knows me. I'm so honored. <laughs> um, and then sometimes, um, just two quick stories. There's a beautiful, sometimes it's very profound when people felt seen. Once was I was reading about um, FDR. In the 1930s, he had a 28-year-old congressman in his office at the Oval Office, and he was just talking to this young freshman house member. And the freshman's name was a guy named Lyndon Johnson. And after Johnson left the Oval Office, after the meeting, FDR turned to his aide, Harold Ickes, and said, you know, Harold, that's the kind of professional young pro I could have been if I hadn't been to Harvard. Uh, <laughs> and then he said, you know, power in this country is shifting to the South and West. And that kid, Lyndon Johnson, could be our first Southwestern president. <laughs> so, whoa, oh, impressive, impressive. Uh, and then. Uh, the final story I'll tell, and this is a more profound one, I read in a book called Lost and Found by a writer named Catherine Schultz. Uh, and uh, she had a dad named Isaac, who was this voluble guy, opinionated, sounds like a great guy. Uh, and toward the end of his life, he just went mute, he went silent. And the doctors couldn't figure it out. And then on the last day of his life, his whole family got around him and they wanted to say all the things they didn't want to leave unsaid. And so they surrounded him in a circle. He's sitting there mute. And they went around the room and said what they wanted to say. And he followed them with their eyes. And he was crying without saying anything. And she has this beautiful passage in the book where she says, I rarely saw my father cry, and seldom did. But for this time, for what may have been the last time in his life, and perhaps the most important, I was glad he was crying. Because he saw who he was, the center of our circle, the source and subject of our abiding love. And so that's a guy who died well seen. It's just a beautiful little passage of a family like, yeah, we see you at the end. We see all you've been. And so those are some profound moments of when somebody really gets known. Um, uh, two good questions. That I'll, I'll put them together. They're, they're somewhat. Uh, related, but uh, Reen asks, um, what, did, what advice would you offer for those of us working on the ground daily when faced with uh, a backlash uh, in terms of a lot of what we've talked about in terms of people not connecting and not connecting with each other, you know, in terms of how you kind of spread this message and this compassion uh, to a, uh, the broader community. And Hannah asks, um, uh, in your opinion, what is an appropriate vehicle to teach morality in today's society? 
um, you know, previously religious institutions held this role. So, you know, I suppose, you know, how, how, how can we hope for this kind of uh, moral correction to take place now or get yeah. started now? Well, I do think the lack of moral resources is a big problem for our society. That our founders, starting from John Adams and Ben Franklin, had a low but realistic view of human nature. That were wonderfully made, but were also kind of selfish. And they looked around and they decided that if we're going to make a democracy out of these creatures, we're going to have to do a lot of moral formation. And so if you looked at throughout American history, there were all sorts of institutions thought their job was to morally form the people in them. Schools, you go through the school literature, up until the 1950s or 40s, character formation was the single most important thing schools thought they were doing. It was not trying to get their kids into Harvard. It was doing moral formation. There was a school, a headmaster at one school I read about. My job as a headmaster is to produce students who are acceptable at a dance, invaluable at a shipwreck. So the kind of people you can count on. And they did things that we would regard as corny. And I wouldn't want to go back to a lot of the old character formation models. But they would have a courtesy club, a thrift club, uh, the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, the YMCA, the YWCA. They were all, even the unions in the, in the day, here's how you do things up to our standard. And most schools where I now teach, they just don't do it. And my students are wonderful students, of course. But they've been given no moral vocabulary to think about how to become a better person. And they don't even have the words. And in my view, if you don't have words like sin and grace and redemption, you don't know what's going on in here. And so they're, they're, they're really good at getting jobs. They're not great at how does my character become better. And, they, and my students understand that. They, they know they're good people. They know they're struggling. But they know they've been given no preparation. They're morally inarticulate is how one of my students said it. Uh, and so I, I think we, a lot of our institutions have to just do a, a lot better um, at doing moral formation. And my little version was this book. And so a lot of people, when they think of morality, a lot of male philosophers in particular, construct a vast abstract intellectual system, like Immanuel Kant mm -hmm. with principles and don't treat other people as ends, or treat other people as ends, not means. But a lot of these guys, it's amazing how many moral philosophers like Kant and Hobbes and people like that, A, they were guys, B, they were bachelors, C, they had no kids. <laughs> And so it's easy to have, think of morality as an abstract system when you have no kids and you're not hanging around other human beings. And, but in the 1940s, a whole group of women philosophers came along and said, no, morality is, is being kind and considerate in the concrete circumstances of life. And so one of my heroes is a, a, a novelist and a philosopher named Iris Murdoch. And she says, most of the time we look through people through selfish eyes. How can I use this person? What's this person going to, how are they going to help me? She says, our job is to try to s drop that egotistical eye and see people as they really are. And she says, our goal is to cast what she called a just and loving attention on others. Uh, and she says, we can grow by looking. And so her philosophy is really about how to improve how you see other people. And there's another woman living a little earlier but who had a big influence on Iris Murdoch named Simone Weil. And Simone Weil was a mystical writer in World War II, a French woman. And she says, attention is the ultimate moral act. How do I cast attention on other people? And she said, attention is the ultimate form of prayer. And wh when I read that passage, I read a passage with um, Mother Teresa. And she's being interviewed by Dan Rather. And Dan Rather says, um, what, when you pray, what do you ask for? ask from God. And she says, I don't really ask things from God. I just listen to God. Mm. And Dan Rather says, well, what is he saying to you? And she says, oh, he's not saying anything. He's just listening to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I always like that. I always like that. <laughs> um, a lot of great questions here. I'll, I'll give them to David uh, afterwards. Um, but I'll just maybe put these three together, because for a lot of people who, who followed you for a long time, um, this book is absolutely kind of at a more personal uh, and, and you know, interpersonal level than, than what people might think of in terms of your many years covering Washington or working in Moscow or, or the Middle East. Um, but in terms of the United States uh, overall, um, two of these questions that they didn't put a name, which I mean, that's fine. But uh, someone says, uh, do you think there's any way that this extreme divisiveness in the United States 
uh, and slash the world can can improve. Uh, and then someone else says, your perspective and sense of balance and reason is so appreciated. What is your biggest fear for the country? And then somewhat related to that, Linda asks, um, what can we do as individuals to protect our democracy? Yeah, I mean, my, my biggest fear for the country is um, that this social breakdown will paralyze us as a country. And so I'm, in some ways, I'm quite optimistic about America. I think our economy is probably the healthiest in the world. Uh, I think uh, in many social trends are heading in the right direction. Uh, you know, the crime is coming down, with the exception of Washington, D.C. Um, uh, divorce is coming down. Teen pregnancy is coming down. Uh, in many ways, uh, young people are um, much uh, more wholesome. I don't know if that's the right word but are doing fewer risky, dangerous things than my generation did. Frankly, I come to Houston, uh, and I've written this, so I'm not just kissing up to you guys. Um, <laughs> I think Houston handles diversity reasonably well. I understand nothing's perfect, but you've got an amazingly diverse city here. Uh, and for a city like this, in my personal interactions, over, especially over the last 10 years that I've been coming here more frequently, uh, there's just an optimism and hopefulness and a, it's less about the past and more what you can do in the future. That's my vibe yeah, that I get here. And so I think that's good news. I have a friend who's an economist who says, take a legal pad and draw a list of all the problems in this country on one side. And the other side of the legal pad, write the following sentence, America has more talent than ever before. And I think that's true. Uh, Mostly, some because of immigrants, some because we become a fairer society, so it's not just white males who get to utilize their talents. And I think we're the most innovative country on the face of the earth. Uh, you look at the, it, the, I think it's eight of the top 10 uh, com uh, companies on earth are American. You look at cultural dominance, Taylor Swift herself is her, is her <laughs> own country. Um, and so I'm optimistic, but here, I'm about to get a little more political. Um, when I see what happened in the United States Senate last week, where democracy is the art of you present your ideas, we'll present ours, let's see if we can compromise on something that's better than the status quo. And what happened last week is the Republicans and Democrats and an independent negotiated a compromise on big issues, the border, Ukraine, Israel, and the Republicans got about 90% of what they asked for, and Democrats got about 10% of what they asked for. And Republicans walked away from the deal because they seem to believe that someday in the near future there'll be a dictatorship and they're gonna get everything they want. And that really sobered me um, because it really was a sign that for all the strength of America, technologically, economically, the political polarization can have a, can have a potentially fatal damaging effect mm -hmm. on making it impossible for us to solve any problems. And not only us solving our problems like the border, but imperiling the democratic nation of Ukraine, imperiling NATO, destroying America's reputation in the world. That, I'm, a, I'm like known at the times as the unrealistic, optimistic one. <laughs> but the, those events last week were very sobering to show how much our political dysfunction could really take down the country. Um, well, thank you. It's, uh, yeah. it's not a... The, the most cheerful way to, to conclude, but, it, but, it, but it's a very realistic and, and I may suppose forceful way to kind of, we should appreciate what we have, but democracy isn't a given and, 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 and reasonableness and, and 
uh, compromise and working together is something we, we all need to do at a personal level and, and hopefully our, our government will do it as well. Um, uh, all these books are pre-signed by David. Um, if some of you have the time, if you're interested, David uh, has agreed to, to sign uh, some books outside afterwards. So if you will bear with me, I'm not trying to be rude, but if I have to kind of rush David out around the corner of the room, just get him out there quickly. Uh, but I want to thank you all for coming and, and will you all join me in please thanking David Brooks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.